So tonight, uh, I'm going to be reading uh, excerpts from a couple of my plays. The, um, I know that the title of the evening probably led a number of people to think that there was going to be a hell of a lot of talking. Um, in a way, there will be, but in many ways, um, I think we are going to leave a space for discussion uh, after the readings, you know, questions, answers, and, and, and so on. In terms of the, I was having lunch with a, a, one of my newfound colleagues here yesterday, and she um, mentioned something about the poetics of, of resistance. And um, it occurred to me that this phrase, which I sort of ended up picking, and then Anne, at the time, uh, Anne um, accepted it, um, it, didn't, it, it, was, it was simply a phrase at the beginning. Um, and then I realized that it does sum up a lot of what I think my practice is in terms of how I locate myself as a post-colonial theater artist, and that a lot of the art from post-colonial Africa, if you can go back even to its inception uh, through those who wrote under negritude, for example, that it was conceived from the beginning as um, uh, uh, an, an art, artistic sort of response and an artistic way of rebelling and revolting against the status quo, which was initially colonialism and then ironically uh, a lot of the regimes that um, followed uh, colonialism that many of which um, um, are alive and well, I think, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's only yesterday we had some, I think the guy in Ivory Coast uh, was, <laughs> was finally so <laughs> unearthed and surrendered. But, um, you know, the Mugabe's are still reigning supreme. The president of my own country is now there for 24 years, uh, plus change. And um, he has just won another new term. So uh, it leads us to sort of question even how to define ourselves. But the one thing that doesn't seem to change then is, is definitely the, that thing, the question of resistance. But I think also the question of aesthetics, because it's not as often, uh, I think, the post-colonial uh, can be misleading because uh, people think of it as something very issue-oriented. Uh, but I think that uh, many of the artists who practice in it uh, pay very meticulous attention to their craft and to, to the beauty of, of the art. And so um, I hope that, that tonight you perhaps see something, a little bit of that, both the substance and maybe the, 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 the zeal, if, if any, behind some of the, the work. Um, I'll read at first from a, a play called Napoleon of the Nile. And it's um, a play now that was written quite a few years ago, and it's set um, at the time, at set in Kenya, in a refugee camp, and it's a, a group of Sudanese refugees who, seven years after they escaped from their country, decide to get together and share a few stories, but namely to reenact their own voyage across um, the Sudan into their first country of asylum, and then eventually into um, another country of asylum, as in Kenya. And um, they, um, they are primarily three characters in the play. Napoleon of the title, who is sort of a precocious uh, teenager, and um, a woman by the name of Alu, who is a young, widowed, uh, prematurely widowed uh, mother. And then there is uh, a man in his 60s who is a, a school teacher um, that they refer to as, as the old one. A lot of the play is about how these people cope with their plight. I know things have changed dramatically in the Sudan now, 
that the people I'm talking about have their own country, uh, pretty much, we hope they do. But at the time, obviously, that the play was written, they didn't, and I was trying to sort of, for years I felt that I had a, a bit of an appointment with, with that world of the refugee, because I myself had been one. Um, and myself and you know, a number of my friends had actually lived in actual camps in Kenya. Uh, and so it was a combination of that and how I felt about a story that I had read um, about a, a, you know, a young Sudanese man by the name of Napoleon that I, I sort of felt that I had found a vessel for something that um, I had been kind of obsessed with but had not quite found a way um, to address it. So um, I read some of the stage directions where they're crucial, otherwise I'll leave it up to you. It's, and the scene is, is primarily a couple of people, so it's easy, easy to uh, distinguish the, uh, the voices. I'll just name the characters at the beginning and then I think you'll be able to follow. <clears throat> a gun goes off in the vicinity. A few seconds later, another bullet, probably a tracer, lights up the sky in the back. A mysterious character appears in the background. Hand in hand, Alu, this is the young mother, leads the way with Napoleon as some kind of human shield. They stop their rapid sprint as another gun goes off. The point, maybe I shouldn't really dwell on it too much, is that I'm interested in partly what these people do to pass the time, as you'll probably uh, um, notice. Alu, they're right in front of us. Fall behind me. I'll give you cover. They turn the opposite direction. A uniformed figure appears firing over their heads. Alu holds a water can in her hand. The other is still clutching Napoleon's hand. Napoleon carries the knapsack and one of the blankets and Alu's sweater. Alu again, down! A gun goes off one more time as they exit, now crawling on their bellies. Silence. Before the dust and smoke settle on the scene, the brigand expressionless figure picks their blanket and tosses it off to stage right. When the light comes up, it's already morning. Alu and Napoleon both seem comparatively calm. One would think last night was no more than a little kafafo. Distant skirmishes can still be heard. Napoleon, I wonder what happened to the old one. Alu, so do I. He's safe enough, I would imagine, wherever he is. It's a bit strange. Napoleon, true, he probably went to the other side of the guns, then spent the whole morning looking for us. Ah, he probably dug a little hole last night and tucked himself in. I wouldn't put it beyond him, observing us escape and probably laughing, saying, see, I told you, you pay such an exorbitant price only to be robbed by the very people who pledged to protect you. Napoleon, at least they were kind enough to shoot over our heads. Yeah, for what it's worth, yes. They probably blew their cover. Now they're being hunted and stalked by the government troops and the militia. Those must be the skirmishes that started this morning. Can you still hear them? Yes, the more running battles they have, the better. Maybe one day soon, we'll really laugh about it. Alu, God willing, why not? We must have been quite a sight. Given the old one a lot of food for laughter, if indeed he did see us. Alu, hand in hand, with me leading in front, then back, depending on where the next gun to go off was. And all along, saying in my mind, God, if someone has to go, let it be me, not Napoleon. If I must tell the old one that I didn't wet my pants, he will think I'm lying. My husband must be laughing too. God bless his soul. With tears in his eyes, probably sulking like a baby, 
saying, how come Napoleon is more protected than the US president? They are like human shields, aren't they? The secret service, you mean? Yeah, trying to jump in between the bullet and the president. What a job. Indeed, can you imagine a husband or wife saying goodbye in the morning? Don't worry, my dear, I'm insured for life. And then it's, hello, Mr. President, if you ever get a chance to say a single word. And then all you do is worry about your job and the American people who vote their president in and shoot them out of office, all in the name of democracy. Mr. President, I just want you to know that the bullet stops right here. I think you should apply for the job, Mama Lu. I know, lots of food too, at the banquets and the restaurants. Oh, those, yeah. I hear there is a big one called McDonald's. Where did you hear about it? At school. You should write the president once we, we cross the border. Oh, it's still a long way. Besides, I'm not sure they accept black people to swallow the bullets or eat in the restaurants. I don't know, both. Ah, uh, isn't America supposed to be a free country? Well, I hear it depends who you talk to. Harlem or Queens. That's where most of our brothers and sisters live. You would probably stay at the Waldorf Astoria, just like the father in coming to America. <laughs> you can meet Eddie Murphy, a senior hall, and one day, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. First, I've got to get the job, Napoleon. Well, write to the president. Well, what about my son across the border? Ah, uh, he will play basketball and become as good as Hakim Olajuwon. We are Sudanese, remember? Basketball is in our blood. It's in our birthright. The desert brings out ingenious ways of passing the time. <laughs> My husband must be laughing at us wherever he is. Yeah, so would the old one. He will probably catch us in the middle of the act. Well, this time, he will just sit and watch the drama. Maybe seethe with rage and jealousy now that his pupils have come of age and usurped his mandate. Inspired even more, Alu steps out and starts dialing an imaginary telephone number on an old-fashioned phone. Hello? Hello? Is this the White House? Yes. I'd like to speak to the President, please. What? The President of the United States of America? Oh, come on. Be gentle, Mama Lou. Nobody knows they're talking to a starved refugee that hasn't even come across the border yet. What do you mean I can't talk to him? You, you bureaucrat? Do you know who you're talking to? Some of my ancestors came to your country in chains. Yes. Many unceremoniously buried like worthless cargo in a sea full of salt and sharks. Calm down. Nobody likes to be shouted at, especially bureaucrats. Those that survived the back-breaking labor to build your country were each promised 40 acres and a mule. You are making them feel guilty now. They will accuse you of, 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 of blackmail. And, and nobody talks with terrorists. Not, not, not until they become leaders. Uh, tell the president that we've always loved the Republicans, all the way back from Abraham Lincoln himself. His phone's ringing. He will be on in seconds. Uh, maybe he's asleep. Don't forget they're half a world away. He, he's probably napping. No, it's too early in the morning. We'll be lucky if he's finished his breakfast. What should I say, Napoleon? Mr. President, uh, sir, or, or simply Mr. President. Uh, he's American. They're not terribly formal. I'll just call him Mr. President. Don't forget to tell him you, you used to be an actor uh, at Precious Blood. Alu signals to him to be quiet. Hello? 
Hello, Mr. President. Hi, my name is Alu, Immaculate Alu. I'm, I'm a fellow uh, Thespian from the Sudan. No, no, not Fiji, no, the Sudan. Louder, he's a bit hard of hearing. There, there is some kind of gridlock, you know, the, the Senate, they're talking his ears off. I ask for his wife, am I loud enough now? Oh, well, it must be the full moon. I'm sure your wife can understand that. She must have told you about the farmer's almanac and astrological calendars. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a young, prematurely widowed mother from Western Yiral, uh, sorry, uh, from Southern Sudan. Get to the point. I'm looking for a job in the Secret Service. Yes, as part of your entourage of human shields. Uh, I've worked as human fodder, and indeed, myself and a lot of my countrymen are mobile targets. As you probably know, there is no pay and no insurance, but, but we do swallow bullets for a living. Pause. Napoleon is getting jealous. Alu is listening to the president. Napoleon gets on his knees, begging and holding onto Alu's hand. Don't forget me. I can always scrub the floors at McDonald's, even Denny's for that matter. Beggars are not choosers, and my knees are really supple. Please tell him I, I was a member of the school choir, and I used to be an altar boy. I, I can scrub the floor until it turns into a mirror. Yes, Your Excellency. No, no, no. I, I, I wish you could read my lips. I, I, I'll not be a welfare queen. I, I also have a son, and he's athletically brilliant. If he is well fed, he will grow up to be the next Karim Abdul Jabbar. Has he hung up? No, no. He's talking to the first lady. Oh, it doesn't look good. I think the official who let me through is going to be fired. You better tell him the truth before he hangs up on us doesn't look good. I understand, Mr. President. Yes, we know how deeply you care. Uh, that's right. We, we, we all know how deeply you care for your own people. Nobody would like to see you tarnish the dream. Here, let me talk to him. Uh, no, to tell you the truth, Mr. President, we love it here. Just one or two little things. You remember that decree you signed? the one that outlawed the evil empire? Well, we need a little bit of help. I beg your pardon? Oh, yes, uh, the queen? The queen? No, 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 she's got her hands full. Who? Mrs. Thatcher? God, no, not her. It takes more than a skirt and a grocer's daughter to have the compassion of a true mother. Look, Mr. President, all we want is for you to outlaw our country, our government. Tell them to start bombing in five minutes. Bomb the hell out of our government together with their running dogs. All you have to do is tell them, Mr. President, tell them you'll bomb them until the bloody Nile changes its course. We've never doubted your humanity, Mr. President. All you have to, say, to do is say it. They'll all pack up real quick and sprint to the north with their tails hanging limply between their legs. God, I'm glad nobody's listening. Napoleon, why? They would probably be wondering if we were crazy or not. <laughs> I remember someone cautioning me to stay away from the old one because his eccentricities would rub off on me. I know. I should also have told you that if the old one was eccentric, I myself was already fully certified in the eyes of most people. Oh, don't say that. Well, better this than sleepwalking. It's not out of choice. It's just like my snoring. True. Blessed are those, in fact, who can still afford to dream and snore when their own country is a nightmare.
with no end in sight. Napoleon, we've got to keep hope alive though. Yeah, well then, we should make more little plays. Thank you. Thanks. So the um, next one is um, from the play that most of you have heard about, Come Good Rain. And um, it's a play that I've performed in many uh, countries, from including some places here in the United States. Um, it started its life in Canada, and then it soon sort of came to a few venues here, and then back to Canada, and then to places such as the UK and Israel uh, and Ireland. Um, and especially Ireland, I have to say, where they sort of embraced it very much like their own um, play. And my history or relationship with Ireland uh, pretty much started with Come Good Rain. Uh, but ironically, in Toronto, when I met a group of actors from a small place, a theatre in Galway, and uh, after a few sort of seeing their what they were doing with the Druid Theatre, um, I was able, we exchanged material as artists do. And so they read Good Rain and um, they offered it to a company manager who then offered it to someone else. And then in a few months, I was on the plane to go to Galway to the Arts Festival. And um, so in many ways, my my relationship with um, Ireland was uh, sort of about to begin. It was a, almost a pre-Celtic tiger Ireland, and now we are sort of in the post-Celtic tiger Ireland. So I was able to see it, the country through many uh, transformations and so on. Um, but um, I know quite a number of you have Irish uh, connections here and um, Cleveland, it seems, uh, has a big uh, diasporic uh, population. Um, and, and so I kind of feel doubly at home. <laughs> so, um, Come Good Rain is a very autobiographical play. In short, it's about uh, growing up and coming of age in the Uganda of Idi Amin. Um, and then the Uganda as well of Milton Obote and um, a Uganda in which the rhythm of life very much had become the rhythm of death. And um, so when Idi Amin fell in 1979, many of us felt as if the nation had truly resurrected. Uh, only a few months later, we started to see the, the signs gathering that would usher in a new period of dictatorship, as Obote himself declared when he came back after eight years of exile. He said, I've come to start from where I stopped. And uh, most of us knew where he'd stopped, which was terrifying. And so it was a time to um, speak out, if need be, even cry out against the impeding return of, of Obote. What uh, a lot of, well, what I didn't realize myself was that uh, <coughs> Obote was pretty much in power before he got back into power because he had the blessing of the Tanzanian army, uh, which was resident in Uganda. And obviously, a lot of his stalwarts were in positions of influence that would ensure that uh, he who had the gun would win at the ballot box. And, um, and so the other thing that I didn't know was that in my activities of you know, civil sort of resistance to Obote, I had become very much a marked man and that I would become the first person uh, to be abducted 
from the university campus on the night of December the 10th, which was the night, uh, 1980, which was the night of the election. Uh, and I would be then the first person to be interrogated, tortured, and sentenced to death the same night. And then in fairly short order, I found myself standing in front of a, a platoon of soldiers in a, a forest on the outskirts of the city by the name of Namamve, a forest that had become famous or infamous because it had become very much synonymous with the, the killing fields of Idi Amin's Uganda. And the irony was that uh, where I would ultimately be shot was a place very close to a monument that had been laid where they had hoped to build something to the memory of all those Ugandans and other people who had lost their lives during the awful years of Idi Amin. It's not an irony that escaped my attention even during that night of agony. Um, the excerpt that I'm about to read is from that very night um, in Namamve Forest. <clears throat> You have to imagine me on the back of a truck uh, for some of this. And um, unfortunately, we can't put in too many of the dramatics or the movement. Uh, but that sort of might help you vivid to sort of visualize it more vividly. A blinding flood of lights hit my face. This was Niall Mansions, the five-star hotel where the top brass lived and worked indulged themselves and felt more secure than living among the real people. First soldier, Toa Viato. I took my shoes off. The walk into the building was an interesting display. You should have seen it. A soldier at the back, one at the front as well, all around us, imaginary foes that kept them busy. He wants to somersault, he wants to somersault, he wants me in the middle encaged in this now familiar and spectacular island of steel and human hands, definitely more protected than any African president. Have you been to Israel? The voice sounded almost friendly. Have you been to Israel? I couldn't help but smile looking at him. Were they more afraid than I? One doesn't have to go to Tel Aviv to fight this ragtag bunch. Still, I would neither conf confirm nor deny. We finish the final flight of stairs, pass through a door into what looks like the outer chamber of a bigger office. Less than a year ago, someone was killed in this building, I recall. A teenage girl, her father, a cabinet minister, was at work down the street. They said it was a stray bullet that did it. There tends to be a lot of those when certain governments are changing in Africa. The office is full of gadgets. A uniformed figure sits behind a huge desk. We have brought him, the man who had come co to cause chaos at Makerere. Had finally met the boss, no less a man than Brigadier David Oite Ojok. His name alone made the blood of many a Ugandan freeze. Sir, I struggled through bleeding lips. His eyes were so small, they looked like little slits. So red, more red than they used to look on television. He seemed tired, ruthlessly cold, insensitive. Sir, some of my friends and Relatives fought alongside you during the struggle against Amin. Do you deny that you escaped from prison? Sir, I have never been to prison. Which prison? You are supposed to be in prison anyway. We have it in your file. The boss gestured to him to move this walking blasphemy out of his office. I was shoved onto a small balcony. Ah, talk! Talk! 
talk, you bloody bandit. Do you deny that we've seen you in Nairobi? Ah, do you deny that we've seen you in Nairobi with certain exiles? Talk, talk, name them. I knew which name they wanted most. Robert Serumaga, playwright, buried in a foreign land, cause of death, dubious. Even in his death, I couldn't betray him. All I could say was, let his soul rest in peace. Ah, ah. Ah! I could have dropped a few names of prominent exiles who are still alive. Every silent response earned me another blow. But the pain was getting more and more distant. I reduced my body to an empty husk. Now I was a little bird perched on a little branch, witnessing perhaps what mankind enjoys most. Thank you. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Why are you thanking us? Because you know what you're doing. His friend returned with an ashtray full of burning cigarette butts. Bend forward. Put your chin under your knees. They were stuffed into my shirt all over my back. I remember the story about a Greek Cypriot mercenary on the eve of his execution, somewhere in Africa, his sister who'd visited him couldn't bear to say goodbye. She broke down and wept. Don't let them see you cry. Remember, you're a Greek. A youthful officer approached the scene. What has he done? Sir, among other things, they're accusing me of having escaped from lawful custody but I've never been to jail. You shouldn't take such drastic steps if you don't have enough evidence. Chacha imu kubwa na chemanin. It was as though this is the stupidest statement they'd ever heard. They were enraged. They dragged me back to the inner chamber, promptly explained everything in their mother tongue. The almighty Ojok issued some rapid orders and took one good long look at me. Back at the waiting vehicle, the soldier with the friendly tone leaned over to brief the one in the driver's seat. He says, kill. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Gentlemen, since I do not have that much time left, could you at least give me a chance to look at the moon and the stars and please don't hit me as hard. All you'll do is deprive me of the pain in the end. If you don't mind, I'll say my last prayers. Two things, good Lord. One, these men have humiliated me a great deal. When the moment comes, let me not go like a coward. If nobody else sees my body, at least let my mother see it, so she may not spend the rest of her life thinking I'll one day show up. Shorten the family's grief, Lord, and give them as long and as safe a life as possible. Lie down! I could tell we had reached a military roadblock at Intinda. We are members of the G branch. We are on a mission and we shall be back soon. And so we went through Banda, Kireka, Boyogerere, and finally stopped in the middle of the road. This was the famous Namamve Forest the place where many Ugandans met their deaths. The soldier with the friendly tone pulled me aside. He was a bit of a giant and reminded me of the noble savage in Swift's voyage to Brobdignag. You refuse to talk, so now you will talk when, they, it is to, when the bullets begin to flower. Take off your watch. <laughs> what about the money? <laughs> is this all you have? I wish you'd told me before. I would have given you more, but I left it at John's place, tucked in my little diary. Where? In a corner, below the bench I was on. Ah, you have a diary. Anyway, we have to go back and pick two students who are seen in your company. Thank God they weren't with me at John's. Thank God the soldiers are going back there, though. Now at least people will know and spread news of my plight.
for a moment. I thought about Dora Block, the elderly Israeli woman who was dragged from Mulago Hospital when the Israelis rescued their hostages at Entebbe. What were her last thoughts? Her remains were finally discovered not too far from here. Do not let them see your tears. Remember, you're a Greek. It was getting darker. The front door opened for the mean little boss who'd called the shots all the way from Makere. He stuck his pistol in my lower ribs. Escort me. Excuse me. Could you please not shoot me through the back? I'd prefer to look at you while you're shooting. Goodbye, ma'am. I owe you an apology for overstaying this night on the campus. Goodbye, dad, my lovely sisters, Abby, little Tony, every single one of you. Remember, he loved you all and loved his country. Could you please give me a minute or two to say my last words? Now that you've come to power, through the ballot box and not the bearer of a gun. Even if I'd committed a treasonable offense, you should at least have taken me to prison or a court of law. I know it's too late for me to live, but whoever will continue to live in your country will find it hard to forgive, let alone forget. I am ready. So are they, except for the noble savage. No, I I'm not suiting, but you can use my gun. Oh. Robert Serumaga, what would you have done? Give me strength to go through this. Ah, the first bullet had hit the right leg. I was down on my knees, actually squatted. Before I knew it, the left arm was grazed. The body was now contorted as another got a bit of skin just above the forehead. But this time, the body moved back and forth, never still and unwilling to give them a clean shot at the chest or the stomach. Ah. The next one found my right hand at an angle, just over my heart. It felt big compared to the tiny needle-like sensations, as though it entered with a vengeance. Ah! Then another through the right thigh. There was a brief lull. Someone picked up my friend's gun. It was a rocket-propelled grenade. There was a grin on his face as he put the gun over his shoulder. I stared at him in disbelief. Oh God, there goes the rest of the body. Ah, a big boat-like cluster of sharp little machetes had drilled through my thigh. I was on my back. The feet were burning. There were a few flames and the pungent smell. I rolled backwards. I could see a little thicket and some undergrowth to my immediate left. A bit of a ditch as well. Ah. A solid bullet went through my left ankle as I rolled over. The AK-47s were now on rapid fire. There was lead all around me, sort of like popcorn. The AK-47s were now quite clearly on rapid fire. I had landed in a shallow stream or a marsh. I could smell the clay. Except for the head, I had practically sunk. There was still one crucial bullet, the one that I wouldn't see, the one that would end it all, the one that would enter through the back of my head. It was quiet, frighteningly quiet. Be still, George, still as a stone. What are they up to? Oh God, let it not be that they're planning to cut the head off the cops to show their boss, or simply dump my body in the lake or the Nile, the poet's corner of Idi Amin's Uganda. After what seemed to be the five longest minutes of what remained of my life, they turned and drove towards Kampala. God, save my two friends and grant me enough strength to come out of the marsh so at least my mother can see the body. It's so dark. The abduction was around nine. The latest it can be is 11.30. By dawn, I'll finally leave the world. I turned towards the east. A few meters in that direction was a foundation stone for a monument that was never built. 
to the memory of all that died in Idi Amin's Uganda. Ah. I stumbled eastwards, got to the road, turned towards the highway. Zigzag on the edge of the tarmac, George, avoid leaving a blood trail. That's the spot where the shooting was. The sky is getting even darker. Around me, a misty gray color. Ah, the pain throbs like unrelenting high-pitched drums. Tears are welling in my eyes. The earth feels like a rag slowly pulled away under my elephantine feet. Still, I walked, supporting myself by leaning against a tree or holding on to a branch. My entire family, relatives, friends, places too, were rolling over the screen of my mind. All their faces looked shocked. Lord, let this government not last. At least let them not kill too many people. The images kept on rolling. My entire life, its landmarks, primary school, the best years, short, intense, God, if there is a way of coming back to this earth, make me a little bird, a spirit of the woods and custodian of Namanve Forest. I'll always come back to my nest at sunset and sometimes disrupt the foul murders, enable the victims to escape. You, my ancestors, all of you, from Kabaka Kalema, whose remains lie in Mende, Kakungulu and Mugujula, the two valiant warriors, my grandparents back in Masaka, Bulalia Nakiwala, my grandmother, you who always danced agile as a drinker without touching a drink in your entire life, Yekonia Zirabamzale, you who lost your sight but never your wisdom and legendary charity, my stillborn brothers, you who never left the void, Please pave my way and ease my transition. I see distant flares cut through the dark hide of night. A few drizzles are dropping on my, on my body. It's raining. This is a good resting place. The Ministry of Works labor camp is close. Someone will see the body and Radio Katwe, the grapevine telegraph, will do the rest. I also have an uncle not too far from here. If he is home, he will save the body and deliver the news. Ah, the right arm is already swollen by more than half its size. The trees and the undergrowth swirl at an incredible pace. Their shapes begin to change, taking on the threatening ones of the gnomic creatures and spirits in my folklore. I have made my peace and put my borrowed time to good use. I'm a bird flapping my wings and gazing at the husk that was my body. Maybe. I'll be like Christopher Okibo, the Nigerian poet. They say he was sent back to earth after his death, condemned to sing his lines eternally at a village well. To this day, when the little children are sent to the well, they sometimes hear a pair of little birds singing, now let us sing tongue-tied, without name or audience and make harmony among the branches. I do not recall anything else. I, I wanted to ask you, what about what the horror that you experienced 
how did that affect your art? I mean, were you as creative before, do you think, as you were after what you experienced? Um, in a way, no. Uh, in, a way, in a way, it is that that made me kind of find, discover my voice uh, properly. Um, and um, maybe I, I should share with you some of the... When I left, one of the things that my mother insisted on was that, because she knew how much, uh, how much I was in love with, with writing, playwriting, um, and it was important for her to tell me to not tell that story in whatever form that I may have been thinking about because it would have endangered their lives as well. And so I had an understanding with her and I kept my understanding um, until nine years after when I finally was free to go back to Uganda and my mother and I went um, near the forest to thank the people who had come to my rescue the following morning. And she said, you know, they've kept tabs on you over the years. You're a bit like their adopted son. And um, so we met just as, you know, it came to sunset. And one of them had been chosen to speak for the community. And he said, we understand that you are an actor and a playwright. How come you've never told your story? That first of all, they thought that story would be relevant so, thousands of miles away where I was living at the time, as in Canada, and that they saw it as a play, became very important things for me. And that night, uh, we went back to my Uncle George, who had helped with the rescue, and he lived near, you know, in the same village. And we, um, I just remember an image coming to me that night, an image of a little girl uh, singing, um, um, in the wilderness, it was an image from a folktale that my mom had told me as a child and which became one of my favorite folktales. It, it is the tale that actually opens the play for those of you who have copies of it. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, and then it, it also, as I was going to bed, it it, all of a sudden it started to rain. The way it had rained, you know, that night, about 10 years before that, you know, uh, in the forest. Uh, and so, so as that combination of the rain and, and the, the story then of the little sort of Cinderella-like type of character uh, were to become obviously quite important in the making of good rain. Um, and um, so sometimes out of the suffering, yes, uh, good things can happen. I think that in general, it probably um, is a, a fairly therapeutic medium. And I think that um, uh, you can do some degree of healing. I think that um, if you, uh, as a performer, because we are talking about this from the point of view of a performer as well as the point of view of a playwright. And so I think that the playwright, they can heal themselves in that way because of the cathartic uh, um, experience, I think, that, that these things involve even on paper. Um, and so I would have had a degree of that even if I hadn't been the one to perform Good Rain. That I perform it gives me more a totality of, of the healing in, in the sense that I, I then get to experience it as a performer, I get to take the journey again, and um, I do it with a, with a percussionist uh, on stage who does all the sound effects as well as some colorful uh, musical things. But um, I think that it, 
it's a fantastic medium in that way because it's, it's also the most revolutionary in that the way, you know, we have you here tonight as an audience and, you know, then if you imagine if this is a performance area, which it sort of became, then um, you're talking about a, an impact that's different from a solitary one. You know, I mean, we can all read the poetry and, and the novels at home in bed and so on, but to have a collective experience, I, I think in some ways it resonates perhaps even a little bit more. And, um, and, and you can't underestimate what uh, those individuals, that one night, what their impact subsequently becomes, the impact on them of, of the story that's being told and, 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 and enacted. So um, I think here yeah, from that point of view, it is, um, it is a medium that um, in spite of any of the demands of it that I would suggest to people that, that it's probably, it's worth um, considering. I had a, an experience um, in a, a, a camp, a giant refugee camp, about 600 people uh, north of Dublin uh, somewhere, and uh, in there are all sorts of people from various countries, uh, quite a number of them from Africa. And I volunteered to work with them uh, for a couple of months, and we worked on a little short story uh, to turn it into a one-act play. And it, it was amazing to see um, what could come out of some of these simple sort of improvisational exercises, but also what it was doing to them as a community, uh, you know, with the, the way that it, the drama was able to bond them uh, in a way, you know, things were told that one hadn't actually heard uh, from you know various uh, people and and so so that too I think uh, because of the communality of it that's I think one area that uh, uh, maybe brings out a little bit more but but, but obviously the the healing um, is is a big part as well in terms of the catharsis. Thanks, Laura. Um, is there uh, currently repression against artists in Uganda today? And just as a parenthetical note, today's New York Times had the uh, story of the government trying to go after gay people in Uganda yeah. and marginalizing, or worse, the gay population. What's the status in Uganda today? It's become very difficult to be a Ugandan and keep a straight face, you know, because some of, of what's happening is kind of farcical. It's a basically a tragic comedy. Uh, I think that... Um, when the gay issue has been revived now because the parliament has reopened since the elections. Uh, I don't know exactly what the politics of that are now. I, I've always insisted that it should have been nipped in the bud and that, that that's what leadership should be about. That's where, as a, a president worth his salt, that man, Museveni, should have stepped out and said, we're not gonna have this, it doesn't belong to this century. Uh, let's just move on and deal with it. Uh, and those who don't like it, too bad, but that's the way the world has moved. He let it go. He let it continue until such a point as when I guess he thought that he would look like this magnanimous leader who is stepping in and dousing the flames. But I think he already did more harm than good. And I, I know that one of the gay, a gay activists was killed not long ago. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure now that where it's at, that he can reverse it comfortably. And even if he did, uh, what does it say about him? Because I think to politicize that issue, in the way that he did, uh, was putting our country, that country back, you know, for years. So that's the message, you know, young people get. Um, it's the same thing that I think, to an extent, has happened with the, the battle 
in Uganda against HIV. Unfortunately, uh, there he linked, as they did, as they, those anti-gay people linked with some people in Washington, D.C., where they seem to get some of their funding from. <coughs> and then, so you have the American government, you have Hillary Clinton stepping in, but some of the people who pull those strings are just are right in Washington. Uh, a certain uh, part of um, um, who have linked hands with born again Christians in Uganda. The man who sponsored that bill is a supposedly a born again Christian. I don't know whether he knows anything about compassion, but uh, he's definitely born again. And so, so I think, um, I'm not sure it's gonna get, I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. But I have to tell you that the Ugandan artists, artists that I've spoken to have been, uh, um, un, you know, have condemned the, a lot of that phobia and um, they, call, they take it for what it is, uh, regardless of their own orientations. Um, and as for the, uh, you asked Analia something about, about freedom for the artist. I, I'm not sure that they have it. In fact, as far as I know, there isn't. Uh, and I'll tell you uh, an, an something anecdotal. A good friend of mine at Brown University um, a num uh, last year we were engaged in a campaign to free someone from a Ugandan jail. That person happens to be a playwright and a theater director who was at the time uh, doing a talk show on, uh, on one of the local radio stations. And he appeared in a television interview uh, which was live. And soon after he left the studio, he was abducted and stuffed into the trunk of a car and taken to a so-called safe house um, where nobody then uh, knew where he was. And, and I was in Dublin linking hands with a good number of friends here from Sundance, East Africa, and Amnesty International, and all sorts of people uh, until, you know, and, and unfortunately he was taken on a Friday. Um, you don't want to be arrested on a Friday in Uganda because you probably, your chances of coming out or going to court will not be until Monday, uh, which is the next working day. And so we were able to get that person out and into a hospital because he'd been beaten up quite a bit. And um, eventually he was freed uh, from, and there'd been six charges of sedition. That's the thing, that they're getting all these colonial era laws are now serving a post-colonial government. And they're just simply modifying them as if they were colonial agents, which in many ways they are, actually. And I would not be scared of saying this, even in Uganda, uh, if I had an opportunity. I would not be scared of saying, for example, that uh, as I was told by a friend at Brown, that a young director was about to produce a play, uh, a play that someone deemed offensive. They called him, they pulled a gun on him, and told him to simply abandon any plans of producing this play. A play that had been written in 1969 during the Uganda of Obote, Obote the first, as I call him. Uh, and yet, you know, today's regime, they declare a play like that to be something unfit for their consumption and therefore unfit for anybody in Uganda. There are some rules that they want to put into place, I think, this year. Um, and they have to do with the license for every artist, whether you're a songwriter or a, an actor uh, or a playwright. And that license will be renewable every year, depending on what they think your contribution is. Um, and so that, I think, will be a way to weed out as many people as possible. And um, 
I think some of us, it's pretty clear now uh, that if I'm going to espouse some of the views I espouse, then, then technically I think it's time to, to go back into exile. Let's take one more question before the reception. Yes. Have you talked to, uh, or have you done the question in the Cleveland area, and have you talked to anybody in Caramo about doing no, I haven't. I, I've seen Karamu. I've, uh, I've been there, and um, uh, we have sort of an ongoing um, dialogue, but we haven't uh, necessarily. Um, uh, this, my arrival was sort of quite disrupted by the illness, so we haven't been able to sit down and, 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 and talk specifics. Thank you, and I'd like to 